It's perfectly normal to have doubts. And remember in sales, we're doing something that's a little bit unnatural. We're doing what other people don't do. Our job is to make a difference. If everybody was gonna buy from us, we'd only need a marketing department. We wouldn't need sales. There are some people who will never buy. There's this massive chunk of people in the middle of businesses in the middle who are persuadable if only they understand how we can help them. So it's our job to persuade people that we can help them. It really is that simple. Our job is to persuade, but that can be quite tough sometimes. Person after person who goes, no, go away. I'm not interested, stop it, or just hang up. We're facing rudeness and we're facing challenges and objections and difficulties and we're firefighting. And you've got to be a bit unusual to be able to cope with that. Pick up the phone again, keep smiling, keep going on when everything looks like it's bad. I wanted to ask you, how do you say your last name? Yes, it's Nigerian. So the way I tell people to pronounce it is F like the letter, air like the stuff around us, and then just R, Afera. Afera. Got it. I said, I know it. it must be a little bit more nuanced than it looks. Oh, I get all sorts of horrible mangled. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm never offended because I know it's not easy. A lot of people think it's French, actually. Wonderful name. It really stands out. I wanted to get you on this podcast because I've been watching you for a couple of years and, you know, looking at all your posts and, and I know sales, I'm a sales guy. And I'm like, this person here is like top 1%. Oh, bless you. Thank you. Yes. I was, but you know, I was very lucky because my background was Xerox and I didn't know it at the time, but Xerox is one of the best places in the world to learn about sales because so many of the methodologies they taught us are out there as the methodologies which sales generically salespeople are taught. And I had it all straight from the horse's mouth. So incredibly privileged. And like I say, I didn't realize it at the time, but it's stood me in such good stead throughout my entire sales career. Xerox was a very proactive equal opportunities employer. So in the sales team, it was roughly half and half. And bearing in mind, we were selling quite, I mean, ultimately it was a tech solution, all that was wrapped up as document management. I mean, it was tech. And that was pretty ahead of its time because I oh, well, struggle with the years a bit. I think I joined Xerox in 1989. So that was quite unusual. I mean, I'm so grateful for my time there. I truly am. Yeah, that, that stands out on your resume. That is an international corporation and you were there many years well yeah and that's the other thing again when you're young you don't always know these things and, and people say oh you worked at Xerox how long were you there and I say seven years direct sales and they're impressed because Xerox take no prisoners if you're no good you're out yeah so I can walk my talk there, there's not much that I haven't experienced they've been down and dirty in the trenches and shall I tell you the other thing which I'm quite proud of in the whole seven years I was there I was I never got a single lead. So everything was my own work. So I am proud of that one. It was partly to do with the way the company was structured. They had a, a very good telesales unit, but they didn't feed leads into our part of the business. So what it meant was if I inherited an account, that was fine. And I did, but there was one point where I had a completely new patch. So what that meant was I had to find prospects I had to reach out to prospects. I had to make appointments with prospects. And then I had to do the whole sales cycle myself. And that also included account management, which means looking after them once you've closed them. So it was the entirety of the sales process. So all the things that get split up now, inbound, outbound account management, telesales, I was responsible for doing all of those. And it's great because it gives you a real grounding for what all the different pieces are and how they fit together. It was everything from a, a little company that wanted a bit of printing doing right up to massive international strategic solutions where I was talking at the C-suite level. And what I think a lot of people forget is if you've got a sales force in their 20s and they're selling to the C-suite, that's actually quite a challenge because I reckon most 20-year-olds or 25-year-olds, we don't really understand properly what it's like to be that sort of person in a big company. Now, I'm older now and I get it, but at the time, I think that was probably one of the hardest transitions for me, talking about strategy and how at a strategic level we could support their business when you didn't really know what it meant and you were just saying the words. 
But of course, again, it stood me in really great stead. So I'm, I'm extremely grateful, even though I went through quite a lot of years of fear. This is getting more and more interesting. So like, how did you do it as a 20 something year old, basically get that C-suite gentleman or woman yeah. to engage? The sales landscape was extremely different to how it is now. Listen up, all you new sales people. You could actually ring someone up and go, hey, something new has happened. I'd like to tell you about it. And guess what? You could get an appointment on the back of that. It's completely different now because your modern buyer has done their research and they, they only bring you in really at the latter part of the sales process when they've identified they've got a problem they, they've looked at potential solutions including should they go in-house and perhaps they've drawn up a short list at which point they reach out to you but yes it was glorious you could do things like telephone people because again youngsters something called the yellow pages there's this book that had phone numbers in it and you could get through to people you remember this Jean? And I remember those days, yes. The other thing you could do was write a letter, as in an actual letter, and post it, and then follow up on the back of that, because email wasn't really a thing. We definitely didn't have mobile phones. I had a company car. Many companies now are phasing out the whole company car thing, but it was, it was kind of compulsory. So what I did was my manager told me what to say, and I said it, even though I didn't understand it, and I just repeated this, you know, what we have might help you at a strategic level, what we have might help you at a strategic level. I just kept verbatim doing this. The thing is, if you're selling to C-suite and you get one, they're usually very big deals. So it really makes it worthwhile. Mm -hmm. Having said that, they're more complex sales, of course, and they often take much longer. So it was finding the balance between the regular bread and butter work, if you like, and then the big ones, the whales, and you have to be careful because you could spend a year working on a deal and not get it. So you can't neglect your pipeline in the meantime. And again, I know you understand what I'm talking about. This transitions in my mind for the listeners to pay attention. Like you got all these skill sets refined yeah. early on. And then you said it helped you later. We, we know now that you are a trainer of salespeople, but yeah. in the interim, where did you start applying those disciplines? Yeah. In 1996, I met my late husband and he had a tiny college in the East End of London. We had about six students. So he was an academic and I joined really as the business development person. So suddenly I was overseeing the sales and marketing strategy, which sounds terribly grand, but it really was just two of us. <laughs> You're like this. Because there were only two of us, but it was a college, we also used to put talk radio on in the background, so it sounded like we had some people. So we, we did all those sorts of things. But what it meant was, because of the amazing training I had at Xerox, and they taught you to operate your patch, your territory, as though it was a mini business. So I learned things like SWOT analysis and smart goal setting, which stood me in great stead because I knew how to do a plan and I knew the relationship between sales and marketing. So I was able to head that up. And then over the 17 years we had the college, we grew it from six students to 650 students with a turnover of about three and a half million. And at the end, I was managing a team of something like 35 people. But bottom line, it was sales. It was sales that delivered it. I recruited and trained a sales and customer service team to, to really handle the inquiries that came in because if you can nail the inbound, the people who are interested enough to call you, to me, it should be one of the easiest sales. They're already interested. Otherwise, why would they go to the trouble of calling? I put in so many processes and procedures and lots and lots of training to ensure that anybody who was customer facing, whether it was literally on the reception desk or whether it was on the phone, they created the best possible first impression. And I use my sales background to tell them what questions to ask and then what to do with the answers that they had. So that's really where it all came together for me. That is really cool. I had I had seen also as I was preparing to speak with you, the college. Yeah. So funny. what was the relationship there? So I see you you married into the small business and then as a team, you guys grew it into yeah. this monster. Yeah. And my husband was one of the 
one of the best strategic thinkers I've ever come across. I mean, the, the plans he had, the ideas he had, nothing intimidated him. And although I've been in sales, again, I'm sure you'll understand this, Gene, but we, we have got a peculiar emotional spectrum, haven't we, salespeople? On the one hand, we're supremely confident. And then on the other, we have the courage of a timid little mouse and we take criticism so personally. So it's that complete scale from I can talk to anybody about anything and persuade anyone to buy anything to, are they judging me? Have I got it wrong? Is that the last sale I'm ever going to get? And really, that that is what salespeople can be like. So he was superb for me in terms of confidence. Yeah, he believed in me and I implemented it and it worked. It was amazing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Very well said. That spectrum too. I think it will help people who are listening to know that they can have some doubts, right? It's perfectly normal to have doubts. And remember, in sales, we're doing something that's a little bit unnatural. We're doing what other people don't do. Our job is to make a difference. If everybody was going to buy from us, we'd only need a marketing department. We wouldn't need sales. There are some people who will never buy. There's this massive chunk of people in the middle of businesses in the middle who are persuadable if only they understand how we can help them. So it's our job to persuade people that we can help them. It really is that simple. Our job is to persuade, but that can be quite tough sometimes. Person after person who goes, no, go away. I'm not interested. Stop it or just hang up. We're facing rudeness and we're facing challenges and objections and difficulties and we're firefighting. And you've got to be a bit unusual to be able to cope with that. Pick up the phone again, keep smiling, keep going on when everything looks like it's bad. I, I love salespeople. I think we're amazing. But of course we have doubts because it's hard. I can see why you're a good trainer now. I can imagine being in one of your classes. You've just raised a good point. I think one of the reasons I am a good trainer goes back to Xerox. And it's because when I started, young Jack, 20 whatever I was, it took me 13 weeks to put me on training. Now, 13 weeks might not sound like a lot, but I've just got this brand new shiny job with a target and I had to sell to people. I actually didn't really know how to sell. And for 13 weeks, I was terrified because I thought, they're going to see, they're going to, it's imposter syndrome, isn't it? Although actually, to be fair, I was an imposter because I couldn't sell. Literally, 13 weeks, terrified. They're going to make a mistake. They're going to fire me. Nothing could be further from the truth, but I didn't know that. Again, with age, you get a bit of confidence, don't you? And, and I realise now I would have been fine. But the reason I mention this is the bit that transformed me was the sales training. I went on a one-week basic sales skill course, and that gave me the structure. And I knew I wasn't very good yet, but with a structure, you can practice it, you can learn, you can get better. And I've never forgotten what that felt like, the transition from fear to relief. My absolute joy is working with the starters, the newbies, because I know if they feel like I felt, I can change their lives. I can set them up and they can have an entire career based on just a few days training that will literally set them up for life. That's what gives me you know, the most joy, Gene. It's just brilliant. I can vouch for you that you walk the walk because just the things that you said in brief words, I learned them over like 20 years and you're like saying it like in sentences. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you. I'm always in a yeah. hurry. That's probably why. And you know what? When I do sales training, I, I learned that it really helps to share that journey. I can stand up there. And yeah, of course, I know what I'm talking about because I've done it. But I always tap into that feeling as a youngster and the people around the room. I think it's really important that they know I, I get it. Or I haven't forgotten it. I, I know what they're feeling. You've probably experienced this too, Gene, but you get a lot of people who've been told you've got to go on training and they don't really want to. I, I hope that people listen to what you're saying. Most of the listeners that come to the podcast are redirects from LinkedIn. So a lot of them are already sales centric, but it's like the people who are feeling uncomfortable about it. I want them to really focus on you because yeah. you have really normalized the ability to excel. So Janet, you tell a story of the college and the government 
changing the laws and the eligibility of the college was in jeopardy. And now this seven figure business is soon to be closed through no fault of your own. And you spiral down into poverty because of that situation and you made a comeback. How'd you do it? So I used McDonald's Wi-Fi and the staff, to their credit, let me eat my own food because I couldn't afford to buy their food. And for four months, I sat in McDonald's in Enfield Town, which is North London, and I launched my training business there because I knew what to do. I just didn't have any money. That post of you at McDonald's, I think you posted that. I love that post. And now it's coming back to me. That is powerful because that is the thing, Janet, that you can reboot yourself yeah. Yeah. if you know how to sell. That's going to be a movie one day. <laughs> I don't know if I'm that grand, but thank you. I'm not, I'm not a movie director, anymore, but it's got all the ingredients that where I would pay a ticket to see that. Government pulls the rug out. The, the business is a seven-figure business, and overnight they pull the rug out. And then you got the people like, I'm not yeah. paying anymore. I mean, it's just like, that's just like too too crazy. They say, you know, truth is stranger than fiction, you know, and I can see now even more where a lot of your fuel comes to mm. grow Tadpole. Yeah, for sure. See, I've been going about 10 years now. I really need to find out when I launched. I should have had a 10 year anniversary celebration, but a lot of it has been about working around my children and now they're bigger. It's my turn. So now we're expanding. Great common sense that you're using there and compassion. That's really yeah. good. And you know, and it goes by quick too. I'm proud that you had those priorities set. That's great. Yeah. I think if they copy a salesperson that is diligent and hardworking, I think that's one of the best things they can copy yeah. because there's so many adults say, yeah, my dad was a salesperson and he worked so hard and did this and did that. And they learned to think out the box. And so you share some good tidbits with them. So, so now we know about your future plans, which are pretty cool. We, and your story Janet, it's just what I thought it was going to be. It's just encouraging. People love to always look for solutions, but I know with salespeople, we make solutions. We do. We can create something out of nothing, can't we? Yeah, we can bring money in where there was no money. We can grow businesses from an idea into a multinational. How about that for a superpower? This conversation is so educational and it's like the people too that I've had experience with, with training me and stuff, yeah. you are like, right with them or even above them because you have lived it, done it, reboot and do it again. That's always like, to me, the gold standard where somebody has to start from scratch again. Yeah. And I suppose the nice thing about that is whatever the world throws at me, and hopefully it won't throw me anything too nasty. I think I've had my turn with that. You can find a way out of it. I'll close it. If it's closable, I'll do my jolly best to close it well that's the best most important part yeah excellent i'm gonna make sure we have another podcast before this year in <laughs> about closing <laughs> okay i'm good for that yes because i know that that is a subject in itself and and it's like i would love people to hear your mindset on that i'm, I'm gonna give you a quick insight onto that people get really obsessed by closing closing the teeny tiny bit of the whole conversation and if you do all the other bits properly, they might not seem like the exciting bits, building rapport, doing research, asking the right questions, not jumping in the minute you see a solution, but waiting to see if there's something else. Yes, that, that is 1000% correct. That's why I think it deserves its own attention because yeah. people are scared of that. Yeah, yeah. And they shouldn't be. 